It was the adventure of a lifetime. My husband and I were trekking to Mount Everest base camp in the spectacular Himalaya. But I'd never climbed at that altitude before, and my body was battling to acclimatize to the thin air. I was feeling nauseous and dizzy. My head was pounding, and breathing was really difficult. So after scaling a particularly steep section, I took off my backpack. I turned to my husband and said, I don't feel so good. The next thing I remember is feeling as if I was in a vivid dream, a dream in which I was rolling downhill fast, my head and face repeatedly hitting rocks and stones, tufts of grass. My head and neck were being flung about like a rag doll, and I was literally eating dirt on every turn. And then suddenly, I realized that this was not a dream, <laughs> that I must have blacked out and fallen after taking off my backpack. And this was then, of course, followed by sheer panic when I remembered where I was, realizing that I better stop myself from rolling any further, or I would die. So clutching at stones and sticks, I managed to come to a painful halt. I just rolled almost 200 meters down a mountain in the Himalaya. What followed were some of the scariest and longest hours of my life. As I waited for the rescue helicopter, I feared that I would die. I mean, I, was, I wasn't scared to die, but I wasn't ready. <laughs> then I feared that I would never walk again. Eventually, the helicopter arrived, and two hours later, I was checked into a hospital in Kathmandu. We did some x-rays, some CT scans, which showed that I'd broken my hand and severely bruised my neck and back. So now I had a decision to make. Would I pack it up, call it a day, and go back home? Or would I return to the mountains when I was released from a hospital? This wasn't the first time life had thrown a curveball at me. At the age of 17, I was diagnosed with a potentially deadly illness. It's an illness that inhabits our most powerful organ, ultimately controlling our thoughts, our emotions, our sense of self. It's called major depressive disorder, or depression. Depression, a potentially deadly illness, whatever I hear some of you say, well, research tells us that depression is one of the biggest risk factors, if not the biggest risk factors, for suicide. Globally, 800,000 people die by suicide every year. That is one death every 40 seconds. I'm about three minutes into my talk, and what this means is that since I started speaking, four people somewhere in the world have died by suicide. Scary, isn't it? I'm often asked what a depressive episode feels like. You see, the strange thing is that depression leaves you numb, almost unable to feel. The only feeling you're left with is fear. This perpetual anxiety that something is going to go horribly wrong any second, even if rational reasoning or your husband tells you it won't. But you see, as much as living in fear can become a habit, so can challenging and overcoming that fear also become a habit. And so one day I asked myself, what if instead of allowing fear to control my life, I did something every day that scared me? So I formulated a little plan of action. And basically what I decided was that instead of focusing on the fear, I would focus on what lay beyond the fear, on what I could possibly pursue beyond this fear. You see, in life, our fears prescribe certain pursuits to us, pursuits that feel safe within the confines or the context of this fear. I will explain later. But I decided for myself on certain pursuits, not prescribed by fear, and those three pursuits I would like to share with you today. 
framed as three decisions that I made over the course of my life. Decision number one, pursue experiences, not things. Journalism is not the world's best paying job. Yet this was the road I chose to go down after many years of studying and traveling. Meanwhile, some of my friends working better paying jobs were spending money on designer clothes, nice cars, well-deserved holidays. I felt a niggling of envy, which gradually, oh, green top, which gradually developed into a fear. A fear that told me I would never be able to afford anything. A fear that I couldn't keep up. You see, the one who dies with the most toys wins, right? My opportunity to challenge and ultimately overcome this fear came when I was assigned to cover news stories across Africa as a journalist. And Africa is the continent I call home. So uh, I remember traveling to South Sudan where I met and interviewed a former child soldier. He had miraculously escaped and he was now able to attend primary school for the first time. And there he was, sitting in the grade one class in the front row, starched white shirt, so proud to be able to learn how to read and write for the first time. But there was a big difference between him and the others in the class. You see, he was 18 years old. Now this and other stories entrusted to me changed me. And by discovering these new worlds, new worlds were opening up inside of me. And gradually I started to realize that one single experience, one single encounter, can add more value to your life than a lifetime spent collecting stuff. So, I decided that instead of pursuing the stuff, that fear was telling me I needed to collect to be a happy person, I would pursue experiences instead. And while I was at it, I would get rid of a few of the things and stuff cluttering my life anyway. Sell it, recycle it, give it away. This was really scary at first. But um, you see, you have to let go of what you're holding on to to be able to take hold of what lies on the other side. If you can imagine a two-year-old holding his favorite toy and you're wanting to give him a new toy, a better one, but he doesn't want to let go of the old toy because he doesn't understand that you're actually trying to give him something that's nicer, that's better than the thing he's clutching. A few years ago, I walked 600 miles along the coast of Spain, alone, carrying only a backpack, a little bit of water. And every now and again, I think back to that experience because to me, that experience became a symbol of this process of letting go, of the importance of lightening our load. And then I ask myself, what's in my backpack right now? Is there anything I can let go? What is holding me back? Is there anything in your backpack today, right now, that you can let go? It doesn't have to be stuff. It can be a draining friendship or maybe some negative thoughts. Let it go, because you see, by holding on to what we think has worth, we are depriving ourselves from the opportunity to pursue what is truly valuable, experiences. Decision number two, pursue friendships, not likes. So um, loneliness is a very real fear to the depressed mind but um, revealing who we truly are to someone else can be even scarier as it was for me. And so it was only logical that social media would become a refuge, a hiding place, a stage on which I could pretend that my life was perfect, that everything is awesome. However, the one day I just felt so overwhelmed suddenly by all these supposed friends I had on social media, by the access they had to my life and thoughts, and the pressure of keeping up this facade. I realized that online I was living this very like visible life, 
But offline, no one really knew what I was going through. Not to mention the fact that I was forever chasing all these likes and clicks, you know, the fear of loneliness. It tells us that we, you know, we need those little stimuli. I know that no one in this room understands what I mean when I say I enjoyed someone liking my photos, because you're all fine. But to me, it became a problem. And so I deactivated my accounts. I decided I would pursue my friendships offline instead. So was I afraid that now I wouldn't know what was happening in my friends' lives? Yeah. Was I concerned that maybe some people would forget that I existed at all? Absolutely, and some of them did. But what also happened was that with my online self now deactivated, my offline self became more present, more honest, more transparent to those around me. I could just enjoy the moment. I could just be in it. I didn't have to think, ooh, what filter would look nice in this picture? Or what status update can possibly describe the wonder of the scene? I was just present in the moment. And my friendships grew deeper, more meaningful. Four years later, my accounts are still deactivated. Decision number three. Pursue challenges, not comforts. I want you, for a moment, if you will, to just draw an imaginary circle around yourself. Okay, if you draw in the circle, can you see it? That circle represents your comfort zone, the zone that we are humanly programmed to never leave, because this is a safe zone. But you know what I've discovered? Is that everything beautiful and meaningful in life happens the moment you step out of that circle. But how do we step out? How do we leave our comfort zone? You see, that circle keeping you fenced in, it's not a barbed wire. It's not an electric fence. It's all in your mind. That's what gives it power. And that's what takes its power away. I remember the first time I read the news live on television in South Africa. I remember the glare of the lights, all the cameras on me, the adrenaline, the voice in the earpiece counting me down, three, two, one. But mostly, I remember thinking, wow, what a significant moment in my life. What was the big deal? The big deal was that as a child and into my early 20s, I couldn't speak without stuttering. Stringing a sentence together would take me ages. Speaking was awkward, awful, embarrassing. People were laughing at me behind my back. So, based on this, I developed a fear of speaking, be it on the phone, publicly, face to face. So now, if you, if you look at this fear, my pursuit should have been silence. My pursuit should have been the back row. And my comfort zone, everything but a stage like this. But instead, of pursuing, but instead of pursuing silence, I decided to pursue the challenge of having my voice heard. So I stepped out of the circle. I want to end with a final story. A few years ago, I traveled as a journalist to the Dadaab refugee camp in northeastern Kenya. It is supposedly the biggest refugee camp in the world. More than 500,000 people call it their home. But it's also one of the harshest places on the planet. It is incredibly hot. There's very little green to distract from the desert and the shrubs. To me, it resembled an open-air prison. The dub is where I met 17-year-old Muhammad. Muhammad was unlike any teenager I'd ever met in my life. For starters, he was a refugee. He was born a refugee. For 17 years, in other words, he'd never known a life outside of this camp. Think about it. He'd never seen a paved road, a city, trees, mountains, a beach. But Muhammad had a dream. 
Muhammad said to me that he was going to be a doctor one day. That was his dream. He wanted to change the world. He wanted to make it a better place. And as I sat there listening to the yearnings of his heart, something quickened inside of me. If Muhammad could imagine a life beyond this prison, then what excuse do I have not to pursue my dreams, not to face my fears? What excuse do you have? So, has doing something scary every day cured me of depression? No. <laughs> I still fear depressive episodes and the anxiety that suddenly comes out of nowhere. But what scares me more is not living a meaningful life, is not pursuing what lies beyond these fears that keep me up at night sometimes. There is a quote by William Shedd that my mother once wrote in a birthday card to me. It goes, a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for. And that's my challenge to you today. Why don't you push your ship out, discover what lies your what lies beyond your distant horizons. Pursue experiences, not things. Pursue friendships, not likes. Pursue challenges, not comforts. The last thing I wanted to do while I was lying in hospital in Kathmandu was to go back to the mountains. But what scared me more was what would happen if I allowed the accident to break not just my body, but also my spirit. So I got out of bed, packed my bag, put on my boots, and back to the mountains I went. Why not do something today that scares you? Thank you. <laughs>